Hello there, listeners. Welcome to this week's episode of the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Charlene Marshall, and you might have heard some criticism out there in the world that we're now in a place as a society where psychobabble has kind of become a part of everyday speech. And you've got people out there calling like, everybody's a narcissist or whatever. And it's been a bit of a, a fad, kind of an increasing talking point, I feel like, over the last five years or so, that everybody's out there saying that everybody is gaslighting everybody else. So I understand if the title of this week's episode, the start of today's episode, comes with a bit of an internal eye roll. I'm not going to judge you if that's your reaction. All I ask as we kick this one off, hear me out. Keep an open mind. Because the more that I have studied behavior change and emotional regulation and what effective coaching looks like, the more that I think that there is a trap that many of us are falling into. And I, I, when I mentor coaches, when I give speeches, when I consult on other people's projects, I hear this trap happen and come up over and over and over again. And so I think the best name for this trap might be gaslighting. We're going to look at it together, and then I want to see and hear what you think. So let's start to wander down this path together. Are you gaslighting your clients? Or if you are not a trainer or a coach, and I know quite a few of your listeners are out there listening for yourself, you might also be gaslighting yourself. So even if you are not a practitioner one-to-one, consider going on this journey with us. Because I think this might be a thing that more people do than they actually realize they do. And I want this knowledge for you. Okay, let's do it. Okay. I think it's very important whenever we talk about anything like this, that we start by defining our terms. People are out here throwing these words around. The words don't always mean what we have intuited that they mean. We pick them up through social media. We kind of absorb them through osmosis. So let's get 100% clear about what we mean when we say gaslighting term gaslight came from a 1940s movie also called Gaslight. In that movie, this very charming man marries a woman that he thinks has a stash of like gems in her house. He sets out to deliberately and intentionally convince her that she is insane by telling her that the things she's experiencing aren't real. And he starts off with like little things that happens and he tells them, oh, no, no, what do you mean? That didn't, that didn't happen. What are you talking about? And then gradually he makes it bigger and bigger things. And the belief is that if she starts to think she's insane, eventually he's going to be able to have her institutionalized and then he can like rip up the house and have all of her resources and affluence for himself. Fortunately, enter a third party, uh, a reliable narrator someone who she shares with what's happening and they validate for her that no, 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 your perception of reality is real. He is a bad guy and she gets herself out of there. She escapes that jerk. Um, So gaslighting in its truest form is manipulating someone's understanding of their own reality so that they are denying the perception of their reality. They're telling themselves that what they have actually lived and felt and experienced is not real. And typically it's doing it for one's own gain. And that's really what we're going to focus on is this questioning of one's reality, one's interpretation of what is real and true. I think one of the most important facets of gaslighting that I want to highlight from the jump on this episode, as I was out reading and absorbing, and I've been thinking about doing this episode for a long time. People don't always know that they're doing it. I think that is 100% true. I think that there are people who are out there doing things like this intentionally because they are selfish and they are bad actors and they just want what they want for themselves. And that is not everyone. There are lots of people who have learned maladaptive ways of moving through the world from someone else. And they haven't even considered that they might be doing it. They haven't had cause to deprogram it. They haven't gotten the right feedback. Sometimes those people are coaches and trainers and practitioners of help. 
And I can even pull up plenty of examples from my own life where I have been the recipient and where I have been the actor. And we're going to share lots of examples in this episode as I make my argument that maybe we're gaslighting our clients or even ourselves. And let's kick off with one of those examples right now. Very early in our relationship, my husband had a communication habit. Now, this was early days in the pandemic. I would express a challenging emotional state. And he would pretty much immediately tell me why what I was saying was wrong. And it drove me nuts. Because I wasn't talking about an objective fact. I wasn't sharing an opinion. I literally was saying my experience of my own reality emotionally. And that summer of 2020, there was a lot going on. And we were living in Brooklyn. And I was having a lot of feelings. (laughs) Um, I considered that to be an unintentional form of gaslighting. Because he was just telling me flat out that my perception of my own reality wasn't accurate, even though what I was saying was, this is my experience. Here's why I think it's gaslighting. There's generally considered to be four kinds of gaslighting behavior. So there's outright lying, manipulation of reality, scapegoating, which is when you like blame somebody for something that they didn't do as if it's their own fault, And coercion, which is like the implied threat of some negative consequence gets somebody to behave a certain way. I would hope that there's not a practitioner listening to this show that is out there outright lying to their clients. Because if you are, this episode is not going to help you. I encourage you to, to go seek professional assistance. The sticky wicket comes when we start talking about manipulation of reality scapegoating, and coercion for people who don't even realize that they have been socialized to do it. And I've seen it go something like this. Here's a couple of examples, real world things that I have observed directly in the business. Client comes in, they start sharing how they're struggling. They're not seeing the results that they wanted. They're really just not happy with how things are going. And trainer, concerned about losing the client, immediately starts trying to justify to the client it's all in their head, or they just haven't given the program enough time, or you're hunting with questions because you're looking for evidence about how they might have cheated on the program because there's definitely nothing wrong with your program, right? They're looking for ways to invalidate the client's lived reality. The motivation Maybe it's for the client's benefit, or maybe they're afraid they're going to lose that client. Gaslighting either way, because you're trying to look for a way to invalidate the client's experience. In my opinion, that's what that is. Okay, so that's example number one. Example number two, I have been guilty of this many years ago. This one is real for me. I'm going to own it. The client is having a very real and very negative emotional experience that is clearly affecting their overall well-being. Now, before I understood how detrimental this particular reaction could be, and it is a very common reaction, I try to give them a pep talk. I tell them all the good things that they have going for them as counterfactual evidence to the feeling that they are having in that moment, right? So they come in and they're like, I'm not doing so great, coach. They start telling me a bit about how they're feeling emotionally. And I'm like, wait, but I just start telling them all the awesome stuff that you shouldn't feel that way. Look at how great. So gaslighting. Right? I'm trying to manipulate their perception of their reality. Might even be, depending on how I went about it, could be coercion. Right, That's toxic positivity. It's to try to wash over, you know, no, no bad vibes, right? Like that's coercion because you're threatening like, oh, what happens if I have bad vibes? Okay, so that's example number two. But I actually think that there's a more obvious example of coercion that's actually way more harmful and way more common. And it's the way that the fitness and wellness space have been taught to market. We have been taught to tell people all the horrible health and beauty and movement outcomes that they'll get if they don't do our program. Fitness Marketing 101 is to lead with the pain point. 
And I was directly taught this as a baby trainer. Do the functional movement screen. Tell them everything that's wrong with their movement. Now they have to hire you because you got to fix it. You just told them everything that was wrong. Threatening with a negative is coercive marketing practice. Is it gaslighting? Let's continue to explore. You're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Arlene Marshall. And I'm asking today, are you gaslighting your clients and maybe yourself? I see people doing this to themselves. I have also done this to myself, right? You're having a very real, valid, emotional experience. And then you don't really allow yourself to even feel it fully. You kind of talk yourself out of it or distract yourself. You know, you, you find a way to invalidate that emotional experience. And I've had a few times in my life that I've overlearned this lesson more than once. But honestly, the most recent one for me has been anger. And I've been hearing this from a lot of people lately, actually. And to be clear, I don't mean like snippy little annoyance, like leave me alone, snapping anger. I mean, like deep rooted anger in earnest, the kind of like existential anger that comes when you've been suppressing it for far too long. I grew up in a kind of way where anger would be punished, like that kind of anger would be punished. And so when I really started working on my emotional intelligence, because I thought, okay, leveling up my emotional intelligence is going to make me a better coach, is going to make me a better partner, it's going to make me a better person. When I started that doing that work, as often happens when we do work in ourselves, you open up the can of worms and it's full of worms, right? Um, you start to work on yourself. You start peeling back the layers of how you compensate, and why, and who you want to be when you grow up. And you start to realize, like, you turn the lights on in a messy room and you're going to see more of the mess. And what I found was this well of anger that it took me a while to understand and unpack. And I would argue I'm probably still unpacking some of it. So for decades, I would rationalize that anger with other things. I'd talk myself out of it. I would manipulate and scapegoat and coerce myself into invalidating that emotional experience. And I think that speaks to, I share that because I want to speak to this idea that these patterns are unintentional oftentimes. You know, if you grew up in an environment where there was someone in a position of power or authority, whether it's in your household or just generally in your life, and that person used gaslighting tactics on the people around you, you're not going to think that gaslighting is unusual. You're going to be acclimated and normalized to it as a style of communication, right? What do you mean you're upset? You got no right to be upset. Oh, I guess I don't have to be right to be upset. Of course you do. It's your valid human experience. Maybe how you express it could be improved. <laughs> So we internalize these patterns of thought and communication. We weave them into our sense of how our, how we and the world work. And it takes work in yourself to unlearn all of that. But I will speak from my own personal experience. I think that is work that is very much worth doing. And I've seen that work do good work in the lives of my clients too. As you gain a deeper understanding of yourself, you learn who you really are. You also unlearn to tolerate that kind of invalidation from other people. And I think you're less likely because you've deprogrammed it in yourself. You're not going to keep putting it out into the world. So you're not going to do it anymore yourself. You're not going to pass that trash on when we start to unravel and deprogram and unlearn that communication style and how to tolerate it. And it starts, you know, how we talk to ourselves. Part of the problem that I think we're into right now and part of why I started this episode with like a big old caveat of like, I'm not sure because, you know, we call everything gaslighting now. Um, we're in a place that if you say you're gaslighting, it's an insult. And I think it's even an insult to the character of the person that you're saying that to. So the first time that I told my husband, like, hey, you know that thing you're doing, um, you're, you're gaslighting me. He was so defensive, right? How dare I imply that he is a gaslighter? 
because we've turned it into a statement on someone's identity as opposed to just a behavior, right? A communication pattern that could be improved. So he heard it like, I'm saying you're a bad person. And that's not at all what I was saying. I'm saying like, ah, I think you need you to validate my emotional experience here. And so you as a coach, you as a trainer, when I'm saying like, are you gaslighting your clients? I'm not saying you're a bad coach or trainer. I'm saying like, hey, you might have learned this style of communication that's really common in our industry, but actually think is really harmful to ourselves and our clients. Uh, because of how we talk about gaslighting as a culture, it makes us hard for us to have this conversation. I also really want to draw a line between the kind of casual gaslighting behaviors that I'm talking about and intentional manipulation and abuse, right? The term gaslighting referring to that movie is talking about someone who is an abuser and gaslighting is a way that abusers do the thing they do. So we can have these communication styles without being abusive. We might have learned them from abusive situations. But we also then are responsible for unlearning them if we don't want to be that kind of person in the world. And that means having the intent, the integrity to look at our behavior and call ourselves in and call one another in to be better. So I would hope that any ethical practitioner is not out there doing any of these things intentionally. And uh, anyone who's aware that they're doing it intentionally, like is Melb. Um, if we're in a place where we can't give people this kind of feedback, where we can't have this kind of conversation about gaslighting behaviors, if you can't look at yourself, then you can't unlearn it. That's not going to help anybody. <laughs> so we're going to be brave little toasters. We're going to step into this space of looking at our own behavior, owning when we've done it ourselves, and then look at how do we make it better. You're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Arlene Marshall, and I'm asking, are you gaslighting your clients and maybe yourself? Hmm? Okay. So what's it look like? How do we know what it looks like? How does it show up in ourselves and in our clients? And I think the biggest hallmark, regardless of who is the receiver of the gaslighting, is someone shares their experience and immediately they are told that the experience that they are sharing is somehow wrong or invalid, whether we're talking about yourself or someone else, right? I share the thing and you go, ah, no, I can't be like that. You're invalidating the other person's reality. And as you start to listen to yourself doing it, you're going to hear yourself do it because it's so common in our society. So I show up and I say, I'm having a really rough day. I'm feeling a bit depressed. And someone else says, oh, you can't be depressed. Look at everything you've got going on for you. You're telling me that it is valid. Or a client says, I feel like I'm getting a lot of weight on this program. And the trainer says, what? You look great. Oh, it's just that muscle weighs more than fat. Now, if we set the obvious diet culture nonsense aside about just like the negative idea that being bigger is somehow bad, we can look at it and see that that trainer is telling their client innocently, not trying to be negative, but they're telling their client their perception of their reality is wrong. I am probably most guilty of this one because back when I was a trainer, I would, you know, have clients live heavy, build up their metabolic health. They'd express concerns and I'd be like, ah, no, but you look so good, right? Because I didn't want them to give up on the program too early. Or maybe I tell myself, I'm so tired, right? You probably hear my voice. I've been sick for a couple of weeks. Oh, I'm so tired. But you know what? Only lazy people take naps. Um, you know, you're, you're a loser. You're punk. If you just quit in the middle of the day, I'm a rise and grind girl. I'm going to like keep at it. So I've got a self-limiting belief there. And I'm coercing, uh, co coercing, there we go. That's what that word is. I'm coercing myself with this negative identity that if I take care of my need for rest, I am somehow bad, right? There's a coercion involved there to myself, right? Shame, blame, and guilt. Three horsemen of the self-work apocalypse. So the problem with all of it, right? You might be telling yourself, yeah, but is it really that bad? Like if the client stays on the program, that's good for their health. I won, like I helped them. Or if my person in my life, my partner, my friend, my mom, 
if they're in a bad place and I point out to them all the good stuff and it makes them in a better mood, right? Like, is that really that bad? Well, the problem is that research shows us when we have our, our identity, our perception, our reality invalidated in this way, it whittles away our sense of self-efficacy, of confidence, of autonomy, and our trust in our own judgment. You start to believe that your judgment can't be trusted and with it goes your ability to accomplish the things that you want to do in your life. And that is the opposite of what we want for our clients, right? We want to empower our clients with the belief that they can go off and make positive change in their lives if we give them the tools. Now, in a trainer and a coaching relationship, what it does is foster codependency. And it's been a while since I talked on the show about this. Um, I have a strong belief that the business and marketing education in the fitness and wellness spaces that I received when I first started in the industry and is very common when you look at, you know, business and coaching courses or business and training courses, they teach you to foster codependency with our clients because it creates financial stability. If I can get a client dependent on my program and consistency for their consistency, I won't have to worry. And if after five years that client still isn't working out on their own, I believe that that's a problem in the business model. I haven't taught this person independence. Now, maybe they choose interdependence where I'm teaching them skills, but they want to keep learning from me. That's rock star. But the kind of relationship where after five years, they still don't even know how to work out on their own. They still don't know how to pick their own habits as they're working on themselves. I feel that that's codependent, not interdependent. And oftentimes that comes because I have made them think that they can't trust their own judgment. I see that in this space often. And I had a problem with it because I think that we learn manipulative business management tactics, coercive tactics to keep the clients coming back so they'll keep paying us. Maybe you disagree. Respectfully, I hope that you share in the comments that you disagree because I want to hear why. I want to hear what you hear as a loop in the logic or if you 100% buy this, let me know. But all, but where I'm going with all of this is how would we stop? What does good look like? And I actually think it's really simple because when I realized I was doing this, I added a very simple fix to how I work with clients. And it made a huge difference in building their self-efficacy and building their independence and seeing not just the results they got from working with me in the short term, but what they were then able to apply and continue to grow in themselves because they were validated and they were heard and we taught them how to trouble, how to Uh, problem solving their own. So as a coach, when my client shares something, even if they need different technical information, even if they need a reframe, I need to teach them a tool to help them. They have some bad information. When they share something about their life, the first thing I do is validate their experience. If it's really sensitive If what they've shared, they're clearly having a strong emotional reaction to, I'll validate their experience and then ask for permission if we can actually work on that thing or if it's too sensitive. And if that's the case, I ask them to speak with their therapist about it. But most of the time they say like, yes, yes, I want the reframe. I want the feedback. But it starts with just like, hey, that thing that you're describing, that's real. You're not cuckoo bananas. I totally understand how in the situation you're describing, you would feel the way that you were feeling or you would act the way that you acted. Because a lot of times with our biggest struggles, what we need most is just someone else to see us in ourself and in what we're working through. And we can then relax a little bit because that other person validates that we exist and that our experience is real. Now, I have no way from out here in the world to tell if what tell them what they're experiencing and how to interpret it, right? They're the only ones living their life. 
So they're the only ones feeling the things they're feeling. And so for them, whatever it is they've told me is actually real for them. And maybe I'm going to give them some different information that's going to change how they feel or what decisions they make. But in that moment that they're first sharing, that's it. That's really real. It is remarkably simple, uh, but it's actually very effective. Even if you don't agree with my interpretations of the events, even if you don't agree with the word that I'm using, um, hopefully the conclusions that we're drawing, the mindset stuff, you can see what I'm saying about by validating their experience first. You set a foundation for a conversation that's about understanding that person as opposed to just telling that person what to do. Uh, because long-term, internal, internally driven positive change doesn't happen from telling other people what to do. It happens because you help them how to think differently. So I want to go through a few examples from this episode and really spell it out how this works. If you're listening to the Better Than Fine podcast. I'm your host, Arlene Marshall. Hopefully you've come to agree that maybe we're gaslighting our clients sometimes and often maybe we're gaslighting ourselves too. So let's illustrate these examples from earlier in the episode. Maybe that will help drive home this idea that there's a better way where we're making more effective space for one another, clients, partners, ourselves. And from that space, we make better change. So with my partner, I said it was about stress, stress in the world, stress with COVID. I was in school at the time. Then I started my business, stress in our relationship because of everything that's happening. What I needed from him first was just the recognition that with everything going on, it was not cuckoo bananas. I was not totally nuts for having a stress response, for having some anxiety, for being occasionally depressed. Who wasn't anxious and depressed at some point in 2020, right? And if we just start with the validation, then we can work on the problem solving or just move on to what's for dinner, right? Next one, client comes in, starts sharing about how they've been struggling. They're not seeing the results that they wanted. As the trainer, what I've come around to do is just to validate. You know, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that you're struggling. Can you tell me more about what you mean when you say struggle? And then we'll look at that together. Maybe we'll make some adjustments. And what I'm doing there is just taking the defensiveness out of the exchange completely. Because it's not about me. It's about my client. I don't need to be defensive. And when I made that shift, what I found was it opened up conversations where there were misunderstandings about the program or about how healthy metabolisms work. It gave me a chance to communicate better technical information where the client had a gap. And honestly, a lot of the times I found that they were like under eating because they were worried about putting weight on, right? Like there was other stuff going on out of that fear that if I just dismissed their concern outright, I've lost an opportunity to help my client level up. All right, let's take another iteration. I mentioned about the clients that come in, they're having really negative emotions that are lowering their well being. And I might reflect back to them. What I think you, I hear you say is, and then I'm going to insert whatever the most salient, the most obvious emotion that my client has expressed. And I'm helping them to grow their emotional intelligence. So I might say something like, what I think I hear you saying is you're getting so frustrated that it's starting to make you angry. Does that sound right? And I'm helping them learn how not just to express their emotion, but even to understand it more effectively based off of what they've told me. And that right there can be incredibly useful for well-being, for mental health, for communication, for fitness, for all of it. All right, we got two more to peel in ourselves. If you haven't listened, if you're listening to this and you are like, yeah, I see myself in this episode and I don't like it, and you haven't listened to the episode Emotions Are Information, go back and listen to that episode from 2021. Um, excuse me, 2022. Work with those tools to allow yourself to feel more completely the full spectrum of valid human emotional experience. Because that's really the key to not gaslighting yourself, in my opinion, 
is the recognition that oftentimes our difficult emotional experiences are actually very healthy reactions to challenging circumstances. We've just been taught to think that all negative emotion is inherently bad, when in actuality, challenging emotions give us information about our reality. So if you're doing this to you, go back and listen to that episode. There's also an article on our Substack, which is better than find.substack.com about that same content. So if you need to read it and reference it and find the tools, it's there. And then the hardest one, I think, that we've talked about in this episode is the marketing and business operations stuff. Because it is so deeply ingrained into diet and fitness culture. Because we have been taught that the way that you sell this stuff is you signal to people the horrible things that will happen if you don't eat right and exercise or whatever right, right? Like all the supplements and the cryo and the plunges and all that, right? It's all about all the bad things that are going to happen that you want to avoid. So do these things. And we're telling people not to trust their lived experience of their own body when they feel good. And with that, we know from research into how these manipulative marketing tactics get deployed, we then look at the psychological impacts on people who consume that marketing media. They're more anxious. They have greater instances of body dysmorphia. They have an inherent distrust of their own bodies. And if we're out here marketing our services that way, yeah, it gets the clients in and we could justify to ourselves why that's to their benefit. But at what psychological and emotional cost? And my argument has always been, If a physical practice is doing psychological harm, it is not holistically healthy because you are not your component parts. You are one integrated organism. And if you are a coach and a trainer, so are your clients. And so if our tactics to get them in the door are causing psychological harm, that's going to have a long-term negative effect in a way that the short-term benefits of a workout can't counterweight. So how do we start? We validate what's real for ourselves and for one another. Uh, I do it as part of my check-in with my clients at the start of their sessions, right? I ask them how they are, what's going on in their lives, what's happened since the last time I saw you. And if they're bringing up things that are challenging, I validate their experience. And if it's relevant to the work we're doing together, you know, maybe if it's really difficult, I'll ask for consent to work in it. Um, but it starts with that check-in. And for myself, exploring these ideas and learning to deprogram my own dismissal of my emotional state has been part of my journaling practice, right? I check in with myself when I journal. What am I feeling? And what are my reactions to those feelings, right? So not just my feelings, but my feelings about my feelings. I find affirmations about our own value can be very helpful, right? I have inherent worth. That's a thing that I tell myself. And of course, for ourselves, therapy. (laughs) Therapy can be massively helpful if this is a pattern that you find yourself in. And if you're a coach and a trainer and you become aware that you are engaging in these kinds of practices, get yourself a mentor. A mentor can help you puzzle out these difficult clients. And what I encourage you to do during your consult with a potential mentor is find out what their values are. Do they engage in these kinds of marketing practices? That is not a mentor that's going to help you deprogram it because they're already, they're still doing it, right? So you're looking for the person who's doing the thing that you want to be doing on that level. What do you think? Do we sometimes gaslight our clients? Am I putting that label on something that maybe isn't gaslighting? I'm open to your thoughts. If you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment send me your feedback. You can find me on my my email address for your thoughts, feelings, and concerns is info at darlene.coach. My Instagram is darlene.coach. Our Substack I mentioned before is uh, betterthanfine.substack.com. And you can find me on LinkedIn. If you're a fan of the show, I hope that you've subscribed, write us a review, share it, share this out. I want to hear from people if they think that maybe we're gaslighting our clients or maybe we're not. How could we be even more better? And I want to hear feedback on it. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves and be well.